an awful lot of people have been sent there, as you know, on the police signature. There's no hearing, there's no appeal, there's no trial, there's no charge. Some uh, obedient policeman comes up to somebody and says, uh, you're going to a camp, signs the form, and off they go for up to four years. That's a method that was, that was devised by Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and was imitated by Mao in the 50s, as I'm sure you know. And uh, the model is still working, what, 60 years later? Even, I mean, Russia long ago got rid of that system. So why, the, why is it still working in China? That's the question that we should be asking every Chinese official and every party official that we, anyone sees anywhere in the world. There are still an awful lot of people, of which probably at least half are Falun Gong practitioners in these camps across China that are making, uh, they're making products like Christmas decorations or garments or, or toys or, or you name it. Uh, they're people, I've talked to people who've got out of these camps, who t one woman I'm thinking of who told me she used to s sew uh, sweaters. Well, in fact, it was Jennifer Zhang told me she used to s sew sweaters all day. And um, other people have told me that too. And, and where do these products end up? Do they end up in stores here in Stockholm or in Ottawa or in, or in New York? I suspect an awful lot of them do. And how come, uh, how come the government of Canada, the government of Sweden, allows these products into our countries? Uh, what we need, of course, is a, is a, a law that makes it, puts the onus on the importer to show that what he or she's bringing into S Sweden or Canada is, uh, is not made by slave labor, forced labor. The United States has an agreement to ban products from forced labor coming into the U.S., but they don't enforce it. And uh, there's a country in Asia that maybe I better not name that has a free trade agreement with China. And I asked one of the officials what they were going to do to, to prevent such imports. And he said, oh, we're going to have an inspector in Beijing. One inspector. So let's get serious about this. Let's say, let's say we're going to, we're going to be, we're going to be show some backbone, we're going to show some smarts on this. We're not going to allow our kids to have play with dolls and toys and whatnot that are made by somebody who's working 16 hours a day for no pay in a, in a forced labor camp in China. The 610 office was set up after the persecution, or at the time of the persecution, started in, in uh, mid-99, July 99, and uh, they were authorized to, uh, to uh, run this thing across China and uh, I talked to a, a policeman in Australia a number, several years ago who had told me that, and this is maybe typical, is that he was, uh, he was told that if somebody was coming out of uh, a labor camp, a Falun Gong practitioner, and that if he and his colleagues had any doubt that the person was going to go back to being a Falun Gong practitioner, he told me they were authorized to shoot the person. Can you imagine? giving that authority to the police in a 21st century, any country. And fortunately for him, he uh, simply said, he, I guess he couldn't take this, and he's, uh, he, 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 he fled China, and he's now in Australia. I, think, I believe he's a citizen of Australia. But that's the kind of mentality that was operating there. Many people simply cannot believe that in the 21st century something like this could be happening. It's something out of science fiction, it's something out of a horror story or a horror movie. And in fact, they made a horror movie in, about it a few years ago. And there was one in, made in Korea where a young couple were, were uh, on their honeymoon and they went to China and somehow the woman disappeared and her organs were taken from her. And this was a very popular fictional movie, but mm -hmm. we're not talking fiction, we're talking reality. So people, um, so people don't want to believe it. That's the first thing, and that's perfectly understandable. But at some point, even though you don't want to believe something, if the evidence is simply overwhelming, you've got to tell yourself that you've got to accept it and then to do something about it. That's the problem. Is a lot of people probably accept that it's happening, but they just don't want to do anything about it. And they have to do something about it. We all have to do something about it. We have about 20 recommendations in our book, or both books, but probably the best one is that the countries outside of China should stop buying the organs from from China? That's one way. Then uh, we have to uh, 
we have to do about many other things, but we have to, to any place anybody from China goes, they have to be confronted with this thing. You are killing your own citizens who do gentle exercises and who, who are nonviolent, who are nonpolitical, who believe in truth, compassion, forbearance, as the Falun Gong community does. You are killing these people for their organs. What, what, uh, what outrageous behavior? Are you a civilized government? Are you, are you worse than Hitler? Are you worse than Stalin? We can all do something. We can phone our member of parliament. We can write a letter to the editor. We can, uh, we can go to a cocktail party and tell a Chinese diplomat that this is, this is terrible what they're doing. I, I was at a, an event in Korea last year, and uh, somebody from the, uh, from the uh, Chinese, uh, he's, he's not in the government, he's from a non-government organization in China, he got up and he made this wonderful speech about the environment. And it was all, mo most of it was nonsense as far as I'm concerned, but he, got, he made the speech. And so I got up and asked him, well, when is your government going to stop killing its own people for their organs? And he sort of stumbled around and he, he, the usual answer, he said, oh, there's no evidence of that, that it's happening, and you know, just, just gibberish. So we all have opportunities when we can confront either the officials of the government or our citizens of China. And if, if they realize they're being, they're being ridiculed wherever they go and condemned wherever they go, I think the, the pressure would build from the top and the people at the t top would, would respond. I think they're doing it actually now. I think the, the fact that this um, latest <laughs> plenary of the party last week and the week before has come out and saying they're not going to take organs from uh, from prisoners anymore is a step in the right direction it's easy to promise this and it's been promised before but the fact that they feel they have to promise it shows that they're getting a lot of pressure within the country and from outside the country and basically naming and shaming is the thing that i'm convinced that the uh, mm. the, the party state in china responds to and people say, oh, no, don't upset them. Don't say anything like this. But no, the, the, what they need to hear is people saying uh, there is not another government in the world that kills its own citizens and sells their organs to foreigners, let alone nationals.